Testing, one, two, okay, good. Good morning. <laughs> um, we're going to need to go ahead and get started if, if we're going to get any time in at all. We're going to have to be prompt with this because we have to cut it off in order to break our stream and get a new stream started by 11. So uh, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of technical stuff going on here uh, as well. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to the few of you for being here or whatever the, <laughs> whatever the situation is. But also thanks to those of you who are watching us online because we're trying to stream this out this morning as well. Because of that, we're going to have to be a little bit different in the way we usually conduct a class, uh, a live class. Um, and I, I will try to remember to, if you have comments or questions, I'll try to remember to restate those into the microphone so that they come through. And if you think, I'm just not listening to you. <laughs> no, it's that I'm trying to make this understandable for those who are who may be at home and need to hear the question that wasn't asked into a microphone. Okay, so we'll be doing those things. Uh, we'll need to cut this off at at uh, probably 10:35 ish, something like that. So that's why we have to get started in order to in order to get any traction here in these uh, in these lessons. We are uh, we are now. Moving in, I think this is class number 11 uh, in, in John, the Gospel of John. And we're to that point where we're talking about John the Baptist. And so as we go through this this morning, I'll be trying, as always, to keep those two straight. John the Apostle, the author, versus John the Baptist, or the Baptizer. Um, and if you get confused about which John I'm talking about, I need your hand, okay? So that, so that, I, so that we can uh, be sure we're communicating with each other. Um, but we have spent the last three weeks uh, looking at the ministry of John the Baptist, and we looked particularly at a few key features. The first of those features was the appearance of that ministry, and you recall that John was, of course, out in the wilderness. This is really weird talking like a... I, I'm just not comfortable with a one-way conversation, but anyhow. Um, John was out in the wilderness, uh, he was raised in the wilderness, uh, but he continued out there as he began his ministry. He looked like he was a wilderness man. Uh, he lived off of the land. The, the Bible says his diet consisted of, what, locusts and wild honey, and he dressed in skins. And he reminded the people the appearance was the prophets of old, and particularly the, the prophet of the Old Testament, Elijah. And when you read the descriptions of how Elijah ministered, it was very similar, and he looked very similar. So uh, as, as John the Baptist's ministry develops, uh, people are starting to talk about it, and, and they're wondering what this is all about. So his appearance was important, uh, his authority uh, was important, and we talked at length the last couple of weeks where this authority came from. First of all, it came from the prophetic literature of the Old Testament, and as we read, particularly the, the prophecies from Isaiah and from Malachi, uh, there were references made to what John the Baptist would be like as, and his role as being the forerunner or the one to re prepare the way for Jesus Christ, for the Messiah to come. And so his authority uh, that he was developing came from, uh, came from his uh, fulfillment of the prophetic message, but also it came from his message itself in that he was, he was telling Jews they needed to repent and to change their ways. And he, made, he left no bones about that. He, uh, he confronted everybody and anybody. Um, and, and, and John was very stern in his message. He called the Pharisees that came out to, to see what was going on, he called them snakes and vipers. 
Um, you know, it's, it's, you don't make friends and inf you, you, you may influence people, but you don't really make a lot of friends by calling them snakes. Um, but that was, that was what John the Baptist was. And so he, he claimed this authority. Um, and he, was, he could be very confrontational at times. But he consistently pointed to Jesus. Uh, in all of his teaching, all of his ministry, he was pointing towards somebody else, somebody greater, somebody bigger, somebody more important in the grand scheme of things. And so his message uh, claimed authority. And then the third thing that we talked about was his message of baptism. Um, and we, we talked at some length about what baptism meant to Old Testament uh, people, and it's very closely linked to the, the passages in the law that relate to the uh, purification requirements for priests, for people who were sick, for uh, people who had contact with dead bodies, uh, for uh, um, ordination as priests, for entering into marriage. All of those things had something to do with the ceremonial washings and the cleansings, and they were all prescribed in the law. But um, during the time of the captivity in Babylonia, a new meaning uh, came along for the practice of baptism, and that meaning was that uh, as, as they were now in captivity in Babylon and in Babylonia, um, there were converts to Judaism, and some of the Babylonians came to believe in Yahweh. And as they did, they wanted to become part of the Jewish nation. And the process that was involved with that was a threefold process. And it, the ultimate step was a baptism, uh, when they would actually become, for all intents and purposes, a Jew. And the three things that that baptism signified for those proselytes who were becoming recognized as Jews, the three things that they recognized was, number one, it was a cleansing from their past. It was a purification from the past practices, the pagan religions that they had participated in. Secondly, it was a dedication, and they, they pledged to follow Jehovah, Yahweh. And so they were going to take the God of, uh, of the Jews as their own God. And then the third step was as they were baptized, they were actually brought into the family of Jews, and they were considered a full uh, Jew at that point, and it, so it was as if they were reborn, and it's a rebirth. And you can see those principles as we see Christian baptism described in the New Testament. You can also see those same principles, the principles of being purified and being cleansed. You can see the principle of a dedication and a time of commitment, and you can see the principle of uh, being reborn and into a new relationship with God and with God's children. And so that's what, that was the meaning that baptism had taken on. But now when John comes along, he puts a twist on this thing. And for John, he's telling all the Jews, you need to be baptized. Well, the Jews didn't understand that because they were already in the family. So what is, what is John telling them as he tells them, you must be baptized? Well, he's saying this is, this is a baptism of repentance. You need to be ready for what's coming because it's a special thing. And so you need to be ready for it. And it's, in, it's, it's part of the process of bringing salvation to not just the Jews, but to all people. And so as, as John, is, John the Baptist is in the wilderness, he is now uh, sharing this message of repentance that's necessary even for Jews, okay? And that's where, that's where we sort of pick up today. So we're going to take a look now at John chapter 1. Um, we have already looked at the prologue, covering through verse 18, and we're going to pick up today starting with verse 19. And you'll see that this uh, falls into a four-day sequence, okay? When you look at uh, the rest of chapter 1 in the Gospel of John, you'll see that verses 19 through 28 are day one. Okay? And during this day, what happens is the Baptist feels some inquiries coming out, asking about who he is and what he's doing. Okay? So that's what goes on in, on day one. Day two is described in verses 29 through 34. And on day two we actually see John the Baptist giving his testimony. He sees Jesus present where he's doing his baptizing, where John is doing his baptizing, but he also recalls when, he had, when John the Baptist had baptized Jesus 
in the past. And he gives his testimony. And remember, we've talked at length about how this gospel of John is all about providing testimony, providing knowledge, pro uh, providing a witness to, the, to all these things. And the first witness that we're going to hear from now in the text is John the Baptist. And he's going to tell us why he is sure that Jesus was the Christ, why Jesus was the Messiah, the one that they had been looking for. And so that key passage is uh, verses 29 through 34. We'll, probably, we'll hopefully look at that next week. The third day are verses 35 through 42, and we see there the first disciples for Jesus, okay? We see the first disciples responding to him. And then the rest of the chapter, verses 43 through 51, are some additional disciples. Uh, we see uh, Philip and Nathaniel brought into the, the fellowship. Okay, so that's, that's where we're headed here. And today we're going to hopefully cover this day one section, verses 19 through 28. Okay. And as I said, this is about some people coming out and making inquiries. Again, I, I'm sorry we're not going to have time. We don't, just don't have time to read the text. I'll put the references up here before class each week. And if you get in here a couple minutes early and you want to read the text, that would be a good thing. But I, I, I just don't have time uh, to to take to read the entire text here. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this section. The first thing we want to identify is where was John at? Okay, and if you look down in verse 28, you'll see that this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. And I showed you this map earlier in the class and I just wanted to bring it up today. We're not exactly sure where this location of John the Baptist uh, ministry was. Uh, scholars sort of suggest it may have been up in the northern part of the uh, Jordan Valley, but it also could have been down in the southern part of the Jordan Valley, and there's some thoughts that favor each way. Um, the, favor, the, the thoughts that favor the, the southern location are this is easier to get to from Jerusalem. So if, the, if they're sending emissaries out to talk to John and see about what's going on, it's an easier trip. But on the other hand, we see that three days later, um, when, when we get to chapter 2, three days later, they're up in Cana, which is all the way up here. So that's, the, that's why some people favor this location. It makes it easier for the disciples and Jesus to get on to Cana within three days. So we're not sure which Bethany it was. What we do know is it was not the Bethany where Lazarus lived because Bethany where Lazarus lived was on this side of the Jordan. Everything, everything in Israel relates to where Jerusalem is. And so uh, the Bethany that's just outside of Jerusalem where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived, that's a different Bethany. So we, we don't know which of these two Bethanies was, this was, but we know that, uh, that there was water there because they were baptizing, and we also know that it was out in the wilderness. Okay. So who's the delegation? Who's sent out? Who, who was sent out and by whom to uh, talk to John the Baptist? Well, look at verse 19. And verse 19 tells us that these were uh, priests and Levites who came out. And they were sent by the Jews of Jerusalem. Okay? Um, first of all, the priests and Levites. Now, the priests and Levites, what was their family background as far as their standing within the nation of Israel? What was their ancestry? What tribe did they belong to? Levi, okay, so all of the priests and Levites belong, obviously Levi, Levites, belong to the tribe of Levi. How's that for a gimme question, huh? Um, but the priests came from a specific family within there, and that's the family of Aaron. Okay, and it was Aaron's sons and their descendants who became the priests. All right, and these were the guys that were the experts in the law, and particularly all the ceremony and the washings and the cleansings and the sacrifices and all the, all the things that they had to do. These were the, these were the individuals that maintained the temple. They kept the worship going. They conducted all of the sacrifices. Uh, they, they, were, they were engaged in the religious life of the people. 
Okay, so we know that we know the role of the priests and Levites. Now, if you take a look down at verse 24, we also see that some of these people, at least, were Pharisees. Okay, and the Pharisees don't necessarily line up with the priests and the Levites. The Pharisees were the group of people, it was a sect, it was a, it was a part of the Ju Judaic religious community. It was a part of them, but their specialty was they viewed themselves as the teachers of Israel. They were the ones who were going to teach the families, okay? And they, it's a very noble calling. But the Pharisees, and the thing they get into trouble with in Jesus' teaching over and over and over again, is they not only respect and enforce and learn the law, but they also teach all the traditions that have established and grown up along with the law. And that's where they kind of get into some trouble. And, and so the, many of the, in, in fact, the very name Pharisee means separate from or separated out of. That's that, that word itself. So these, these Pharisees believe themselves to be an exclusive club. And they, they relied on this ex exclusivity. Um, and they thought they were the only ones who were empowered to do all these things and because they knew the law so well. And so now there's this renegade out in the wilderness who's preaching a bit of a different message. We better go check him out, right? So there, there, there's a, you know, you can sort of feel the tension. You can feel the challenge that's, that's going on here. Okay, now who sent the Levites and the priests and the Pharisees? Who sent them? Well, it was the Jews of Jerusalem. And that's kind of a curious term, don't you think? Because what nationality is John the Baptist? He's Jewish too. He's a Jew. Most of the people that come out here and accept Jesus are also Jews, but these are the Jews of Jerusalem. And what I think this is intended to convey is that these are the Jews who were in power. At the highest levels of government, at the highest levels of religion, at the highest levels of their teaching structure, people had become aware of John the Baptist and they needed to figure out what this guy was doing out there in the wilderness and decide, is this something we should approve and be part of, or is it something we need to oppose? You know, they're calling themselves into a judgment, really, and making a judgment on John the Baptist. So the Jews of Jerusalem were out there. What tribe was John the Baptist from? Who was John the Baptist's father, and what did he do? His name starts with a Z. Zechariah. And what was his job? Where did he get his vision? He was a priest. So what tribe was he from? John the Baptist himself was a Levite and a priest, right? Or he was in the lineage of the priests. His father was a priest, a full-fledged priest. And, and something that came to me last night in the middle of the night, <laughs> I wonder how many of these priests that came out to challenge John the Baptist had worked with his father. I mean, the temple's not that big that you wouldn't know. And especially if 31, 32 years earlier, one of the priests had had a vision. And, and, and the angel Gabriel came and gave him a promise. And this priest wasn't able to speak for a year until that child was born and was named the name that, that Gabriel told him to name him. And so, you know, the, and, and then this priest also took it upon himself to prophesy about what this child would become. And so over the, that 30 year period, there have to be talk, there has to be talk about what's going on with that, that guy's son. He's, they said he was out in the wilderness, and now we're hearing all this stuff. And the angel talked to him, and he was mute for a, you know, a long time until, until he followed the angel's direction, and then, and then all of a sudden he could talk again. We've, we've seen this. We've seen the supernatural involved in this process. And so you know, there had to be some curiosity, just simple, and, and, and wondering what was going on with this, uh, 
with this situation out in the wilderness. So it's important for us, and I, I think one of the messages we want to get from this, it's important for us not to just lump all Jews into one pot. They aren't all the same, any more than all Americans are the same, or that all Christians are the same. Um, we, we cannot lump all Jews into one pot, and we can't lump all Pharisees into one pot. Not all of the Pharisees rejected Jesus. Not all of the Pharisees challenged Jesus. Many of them accepted and became you know, disciples. Uh, we even have the case of a zealot who becomes a follower. So we have, we, have, we have to recognize that these people of the New Testament are individuals. And, and let's not just, when we think of a Jew, we think of somebody who rejected Jesus because many of the Jews accepted and, and welcomed Jesus as well. And the same thing with the Pharisees. We have to, we have to treat them as individuals. Okay, so that's, that's the delegation that met, met John the Baptist out in the wilderness. And their first question was, no surprise here, who are you? <laughs> who are you, right? Um, that's, that's in verse, uh, well, I guess it's the verse 19, the first one there. Yep, asked him who he was. And his response? Well, I'm not the Messiah. So denial number one, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. What did the Jews in general expect of a Messiah? Why were they looking? They were looking again for a king. That's right. That's part of the answer. That's an important part of the answer. And, and a, lot of, a lot of the... Um, anticipation of a Messiah coming was the, to throw off the bondage and particularly right now in this point in history the bondage of Rome and become our own people. But more importantly than that, and I think, I think this is another mistake we sometimes jump into when we look at the New Testament is we think of the Jews only expecting a physical reign of this Messiah. And that wasn't it at all. They, they, they saw this Messiah returning Israel to the glory days of David and Solomon. But more than that, they would become then a universal kingdom, not just a kingdom for um, the nation right there and the geography of Palestine, what was then called Palestine. Uh, the, the, the nation was, was viewed as part of the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, of course. I will make of you a great nation. Okay, and, and you will prosper. And that was an incredibly important part of, the, part of the promise made to Abraham. But that was not all. In addition, this would be a universal kingdom. Remember when Solomon dedicated the temple, he said this is a temple for all nations. The people of all nations will flow into it. Okay, and, and in prophecies, in Daniel and in Zechariah, we see a mountain and a tree appearing that the, whole, that the nations would flow into and come into, and all nations would be part of that. So it's not just for the Jews. Um, and then also, Yahweh would be present and would be the true king in this scenario. So there was a very deep spiritual element in this as well for many Jews. And they saw this as being the coming of salvation, the coming of rescuing the Jewish people. It was going to be the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's favor. You, re, you recall all those phrases from Old Testament prophecy. They're all there. Um, and so it was not just getting rid of Rome and getting the current um, dictator off their backs, but it was also um, going to be something that was led by the Jews. Very clearly, God had this special relationship with the Jewish people, and that would be fulfilled. And so the other thing I want to point out is in verse 20, there's kind of a strange wording here. And it says, John the Baptist did not fail to confess, but he confessed freely, I'm not the Christ. That's sort of, a, in, in the way we read that, it's sort of strange. But the... the um, the original language is much more straightforward, and it's actually very legally oriented terminology. And here's, here's a better translation that I think carries the, uh, the meaning a little bit better. 
John the Baptist declared strongly without any doubt or hedging. That is what's going on here. That there was no hesitation on the Baptist's part. He's, he's just, and, and remember, we're talking about testimony. We're talking about legal testimony and legal defense that John the Apostle is presenting here. And this is the Baptist's testimony. And he even, and John the Apostle uses legal language in order to, to describe this situation. Okay, so that's, that's the first denial that, uh, ooh, <laughs> that's the first denial of the Baptist. The second denial, who else was he not? He was not the Messiah, and he was not? Why are they concerned about Elijah? Why do they think he might be Elijah? Okay, we read from Malachi chapter 4 a few weeks ago that, Behold, I will send the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So they, ex they fully expected Elijah to come back. Yes. In Matthew 17, take a look over there. This is the, uh, the transfiguration. When, of course, Jesus meets with Moses and Elijah. Chapter 17, verse 10. The disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? So they fully expected Elijah to come first, right? That was, that was out there. That was part of their understanding of what the Messiah days would look like, that Elijah would come first. And so they're asking John the Baptist. John the Baptist looks like Elijah. He's out in the wilderness where Elijah lived. And now Elijah uh, is... is they're asking, if he, are you Elijah? When were the prophecies about Elijah actually fulfilled? Who was the Elijah to come? It was John the Baptist. Okay? And we can see that. Don't, don't, don't get too confused. We can see that in several uh, places. We've, we've already talked about in Luke chapter 1, when Gabriel speaks to John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, and he says that, he would, he, would, um, he would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So John's father was told that the Baptist would, would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. In Matthew 11 again, where we just, I'm sorry, that's not where we just were. Matthew 11, um, 11 through 14, we read, I tell you the truth, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. So Jesus himself identifies John the Baptist as having been the Elijah who was, who was to come. And then over in Matthew 17, where we just read about the teachers expecting Elijah to come first, Jesus answers those, those disciples by saying, this is uh, Matthew 17, verse 11, to be sure, Jesus says, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they didn't recognize him, but have done to him everything they wish. And of course, by now they have killed John the Baptist. And in the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. So here we are. John is out in the wilderness in, in John chapter 1. John the Baptist is out in the wilderness um, in John chapter 1. And the... Levites and priests and Pharisees come out to, to question him and ask who he is. And they say, are you Elijah? And he says, no. Is he lying? <laughs> How did Elijah's life end? What miracle? You're right, it was miraculous. A chariot, and he ascended in a whirlwind up to heaven. He never died. 
And so the thinking amongst many Jews was that Elijah, the literal same being, would return. And so in saying, in, when John the Baptist says, no, I'm not Elijah, he's saying, I'm not physically Elijah. But he was, in a figurative sense, he was an Elijah. And Jesus verifies that. But at this point in time, he denies it. Um, this is an interesting thing, and, and we, see, we see Jesus sort of doing the same thing at times. You remember how many times, and this is almost exclusive to the Gospel of John, where we see that Jesus' time had not yet come. And so Jesus kind of hangs back in the background. And I, I sort of think John is doing something similar here. John's, but for a different reason. Jesus needed to avoid the attention because he had work that had to get done before his life ended. And if, if, John, if Jesus became a public confrontational figure from day one of his ministry, he wouldn't have lasted three years. Um, they would have killed him much sooner. And so there are many times when, when John the Apostle tells us behind the scenes that Jesus hangs back from, for one thing or another. And he and they says just... Remember at the, at the wedding feast at Cana, and he talks to his mother. He says, my, time, uh, my time's not here yet. This is not my time, woman. He's talking to his mother when he says that. Um, and and this, this happens a handful of times throughout the gospel. John here also chooses to fly under the radar a little bit. He chooses not to claim to be Elijah. And I think the reason here is, though, is a little different, as I said a minute ago. I think the reason in John's mind is he doesn't want to distract the people from the important thing. John knows that if he says, yes, I am Elijah, they're going to be locked on him with laser vision. And they're already going to miss Jesus as it is. And so John the Baptist is trying to, with every fiber in his body, he's trying to point to Jesus Christ. And so he knows that if, if he gets in the way of Jesus, it's going to make the, make the project much more difficult. And so um, it's, it's just, for this point in time, it's a better situation to accomplish the, the end that he needs to. But he denies, in this case, being, being uh, Elijah. And then he talks, I'm not the prophet. I guess I forgot to put the second one up there. The third one, I'm not the prophet. And we are now at 1035, so we're going to talk about the prophet next week. We'll pick up right here, okay? Um, thank you, everybody, especially for those of you online tuning in and those of you who uh, made it here this morning. Um, I'll close with my, my usual, God is good. All the time. And all the time. Okay, thank you, everybody.